Hello, welcome to the uh, short video on corporate governance, one of the four topics that we'll be looking at in the exam in January. So corporate governance, um, why, why you think about this, find uh, three minutes just to have a look at this YouTube video, um, which explores the consequences of corporate failure. So it's a compelling little argument for why we need corporate governance and look out for different consequences listed in that. It's just a clip of pictures from newsreels and consequences of um, some fairly high profile failures um, over, um, over the last uh, decades and so. So have a look at that. Corporate governance then, what is it? It is the system by which companies are directed and controlled. So that is the system within the companies and the system outside the companies to make sure that they behave in a way which is functional and minimizes harm and damage. So it's the system by which companies are controlled. And why do we need it? Well, if you've watched that video, um, or if you do go on to watch it, you'll see financial uh, human consequences of corporate failure. So the commercial world is fraught with financial, legal, ethical pitfalls and uh, good corporate governance hopefully stops things going wrong. That's the point of it. So that definition that I had there actually comes and is a direct quote from the Cadbury Committee of 1992. Um, so worth, worth learning it, as with all these things, worth having an accurate, short, memorised definition of any of the terms that we look at. And the Cadbury Committee also said in its report in 1992 that boards of directors are responsible for the governance of their company. So it's worth, you know, if you haven't got that clear in your mind, you know, we're talking obviously here about um, limited companies, mostly public limited companies, but huge companies um, and the directors who run the business are different from the shareholders who own it effectively. But boards of directors, as Cadbury points out in 1992, are responsible for the governance of their companies. A little bit of background. The Cadbury Committee came after some huge high profile corporate failures, um, which had tremendous damage to public confidence in the commercial financial world, in which pension funds have been raided, people have been defrauded of their money, all sorts of appalling behaviour which had, had had very wide ranging consequences. So in order to try and um, increase confidence in the system and improve regulation, Stock Exchange, the Financial Reporting Council and the Accountancy Profession got together and set up the Cadbury Committee to say, well, what can we do? And it's one um, of a series of committees which are mentioned in the SEMA guide you might want to look at, looking at how regulation could be improved and fine tune because obviously there's a tension between allowing business enough freedom to make um, good decisions and earn lots of money and uh, regulating enough to make sure the disasters don't happen. So the shareholders, directors are responsible for governing the company in the shareholders uh, role. They appoint the directors and the auditors and they're supposed to make sure things are going properly because the shareholders clearly have the power to get rid of a board in extreme circumstances. So the shareholders who own the uh, company are not responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the company, but they are responsible for the selection of the people who do the day-to-day -day running and for making sure they behave properly. So responsibilities of the board, said Cadbury, include setting the strategic aims, providing leadership to make it happen and supervising the sort of day-to-day -day running of the thing and then reporting back to the shareholders about how they're doing that, their stewardship of the company. So that's how a system that's working should work well. That's what Cadbury said. And obviously what the board does is subject to law. So we know a bit about the law. There's these are non-negotiable mandatory things they must do. Regulation, that's usually um, set up by uh, the particular professional community in which they work and it's slightly different from the law it's not going to be prosecuted by the state but regulatory bodies will um, subject companies to uh, disciplinary action and fine and penalty if they step outside the regulations that have been set down and of course ultimately the shareholders um, are there what they want and their um, regulation of the board's action uh, they must be responsible to that at the annual meetings so what sort of things are companies behaving badly? A nice picture there of a very fat cat. And of course, huge fat cat salaries 
um, were an issue back in the 90s, uh, remain an issue now, the discrepancy between um, high levels of remuneration for um, directors of companies, even where those companies seem to be losing people lower down the food chain, lots of money, um, and whether we've got that right is still a very contentious point um, in the commercial world. Some sort of the behaviours that you've seen mentioned in that, laundering criminal money, so money earned by people doing illegal activities, running through company books, buying property, legitimising ill-gotten gains. Um, pension funds where huge amounts of money uh, are vulnerable to um, to plundering by unethical um, uh, actors in the company world. We've seen huge runs on pension funds and the difficulty there, of course, that has uh, a, an impact on thousands of people and very real impact on how, how their lives are run, where punch, pension funds are um, defrauded of money. And we've seen some absolutely shocking uh, misleading, uh, not just economical with the truth, but outright lying, fraud, uh, destruction of documents, massive misreporting of company behaviours, which have covered up bad behaviour for uh, and allowed it to accumulate huge impact. Um, and again, some of that is referred to in that film, if you do get time to just watch that on YouTube. So of course, that's led to the industry trying, as I say, to respond to that and find out how to stop it happening, if at all possible. So the Cadbury Committee and the ones that follow it, the Hample Committee and so on, they led to a combined governance code, which is now, since then, become the Corporate Governance Code, regulated by the Financial Reporting Council. So that's the regulatory structure within which uh, companies currently operate in the UK. And it's good to be aware of that. You don't need to know it chapter and verse, but have a look at it. It's, there's quite a lot about it in the SEMA book, but you can get it online. Have a look at the sort of things it talks about, the UK Corporate Governance Code. OK, so obviously the, there's a regulatory structure set up by people like the Stock Exchange, the Financial Reporting Council, the accountancy profession. All of those people have an interest in how businesses run. We need confidence in the system. We want um, businesses to make money, to employ people, to, to do things which make our lives prosperous and, uh, and healthy. So who else has an interest in the running of a company? We've got a list here of two kinds of stakeholders and anyone who has an interest or is interested in the way a country a company runs and its success is called a stakeholder. So on the left there, you've got financial stakeholders. And what makes them financial stakeholders rather than interest stakeholders, who are the ones on the right, is that if a company goes into financial trouble, this lot stand to lose money. So if you, if your interest in a company is such that if it goes belly up, you lose, you're a financial stakeholder. So clearly, if you're a shareholder in the business and it fails, you lose your money. Anyone else who invests in a, in a business, so anyone who's loaned it money, um, they stand to lose if the company fails. Clearly, as do employees, people who buy things and customers, they may have given money for products which then don't arrive. People who supply a business with goods to to make their products, they are financially invested in a business and if things go wrong and they don't get paid, they lose money. And clearly, um, wider society through the um, Majesty's revenue and customs. So if you don't pay your tax, society loses out, the government loses out. So all of those on the left there are people with a financial stake in the running of a company. And on the right though, we can spread the idea of a stakeholder even wider, anyone uh, of these lists, and it's not comprehensive by any means, has an interest in the way a company runs. So we see a lot written in the media about how companies run, and they would argue they're a conduit for society's interest, but they have, they are those who have an interest in how companies run. So do non-governmental organisations. Um, Businesses may affect they work, the way they work and the, the freedom they have to operate in, a, in, a, in an environment. So um, non-governmental organisations, activists, people who lobby for change, who work for charitable in charitable ways in, in, in the community, all of these people have an interest in how business operates and they want it to operate in, in a proper fashion. Competitors clearly have an interest in how a company runs. 
Um, they won't lose money. In fact, they'll probably gain money if a company goes bust, but they do have an interest in how a company runs um, and what they're allowed to get away with. And as we've seen, the regulators, the Stock Exchange, the Auditing Practices Board, the Financial Reg Reporting Council, all of these people have an interest in the running of a company. So when you're thinking about corporate governance, think about the wide uh, list of people who have a potential interest in how a company is run. So here's a, just a graphic illustration of that. Remember, the shareholders are the people who own the company. The board, the directors are the people who run it. And they sometimes come to blows. So we've seen a little bit more shareholder activism in recent years. It used to be the case that um, shares might be distributed. If you have uh, thousands of shares, they might be held by thousands of different individuals. But what we see now in the figures is that 60% of shares in um, public limited companies are actually owned by investment funds and insurance companies in the US and the UK. And because the fund managers in those um, uh, enterprises are obliged to manage those funds, they take an active interest in the companies where they have significant share portfolios. So we see lots more um, um, active engagement from shareholders, and that's probably a good thing in terms of corporate governance. Um, and one thing where we've seen large groups of individual shareholders mobilised um, to some extent by social media is over the fat cat salary thing. So again, individuals who have short shareholdings in companies like Marks and Spencer, we've got a headline there of a Marks and Spencer story, have um, organised themselves to protest at annual meetings, particularly about things like the, the high profile high salaries of chief executives when they are shareholders are not getting paid dividends and they don't see the company as doing well. So because the way um, executive remuneration is planned, sometimes ag ag agreements that were reached in things and profit sharing and all sorts of deals mean people seem to get paid huge salaries when things are going badly in the company. And that, of course, leads to uh, pressure from the shareholders to make the board of directors accountable. And I don't think that's a bad thing, but we've seen more of that shareholder activism. And if you were to do a little bit of research on that, I'm sure you'd find other examples of your own that illustrate that point. So running a company is a complicated business. When it comes to corporate governance, the law, in a way, is your starting point. The law creates great pressure. It's non-negotiable, it's mandatory. Companies have to do it. If they don't do it and they're found out, um, they can be taken to court, find all sorts of money and all sorts of problems can be caused. So the law puts pressure on them, commercial pressure, obviously they face. They've got to succeed in the marketplace. And of course, that's sometimes why we see poor decision taken by government, uh, by boards of directors, as they try and uh, make a success of it by cutting corners. So there's commercial pressure. We have seen increasingly, and we'll look at that in a separate video, ethical pressure. The profession wants you to behave ethically. Public perception, society wants you to behave in a certain way and that creates its own pressure. Governments have other things other than the law, but they have other incentives and pressures that they bring to bear upon the company. Um, so the company, running a company and keeping everyone happy and keeping all the pressures at bay is not an easy thing. So thinking about the influences, think about the stakeholders, think about the broad influences, think about what's trying to be balanced. And remember, go back to the CAB committee definition. The board is responsible for the strategic direction for running the company, and it's accountable to the shareholders who own it. And in turn, they have a responsibility to make sure the directors are doing a good job to appoint auditors and make sure things are being handled properly. I just wanted to say a little bit about corporate social responsibility, which is really in this context, this is part of companies' response to uh, wider stakeholders. So all stakeholders, and we said before, we were looking at those, the wider sense of society's interest in companies. One of the reasons they're interested is because companies have a big impact on the social economic environment that we all live in. Um, if you are making money and you don't care about how you pollute things, if you are making money and you're building up a big carbon footprint, this has long term consequences for all of us. So there's been much more movement in recent times for businesses to respond to that corporate social agenda. Um, there's some cynicism about it. So you may have heard of the term greenwash. 
are businesses doing it because they really care about the environment or they really care about um, lobby groups, what they think, or are they doing it simply because if they don't, they'll lose money. But you don't have to be one or the other. I think a company can respond to this agenda for genuine reasons, but also because it's commercially sensible to do so. Because if they don't, and we've seen boycott campaigns where businesses are not behaving in a way which society has decided is responsible, being boycotted, and therefore they'll lose money. So look at, for example, Starbucks and what was perceived as a complete failure to pay tax in this con country led to a boycott of their shops and they then lose money. So you have to behave in a way which is ethical and responsive to shareholders or um, you will lose the business and then of course you'll be commercially unsuccessful. But again, why you do it is a mixture of reasons. Um, okay, what happens when things go wrong? That's where I start and that's where I'll finish. You need, if you like, to be able to look for the signs and it's not easy because I have to say we started in 1992 with the Cadbury Committee, but we continue. There's a current inquiry in Parliament going in to look at corporate governance. We still have big failures. We still have the ethical failure of Volkswagen and its um, polluting fuel emissions scandal. All these things are difficult to achieve. So what sort of things are going wrong? if we're having poor corporate governance. A single individual may dominate. So they're all kind of sides of the same coin here. If one individual becomes very powerful, if it was originally a family business, if the uh, directors are people under his sway or her sway, then that's a bad thing because corporations are big complex um, operations. No individual knows everything there is to know. Any one individual dominating too much can be a sign of things going wrong. If the board is just lax about meeting, if that again will allow a single individual to dominate, if they just don't meet regularly enough, they're not going to be keeping an eye on the strategic direction on how things are being done. They're not going to be keeping tabs on whether accounts are misleading and things are being handled properly. Um, they may meet but if they haven't got the skills to understand the things put before them, they may be unable to give enough control of a company. So inadequate qualifications and skills amongst the board, that also can be a sign of poor governance and lead to poor outcomes. Um, within the business, um, people may be given too much free reign. So we've seen, and there's a film about one particular rogue trader called Nick Leeson, called Rogue, rogue Trader, the film, um, where one individual allowed enough freedom to gamble huge sums brings down a whole bank and all the consequences of that. So you need to supervise, you need to give people freedom to exercise their judgment, but you cannot devolve responsibility for supervision. If the auditors lack rigor, and we've sometimes seen a failure to pick things up, but we've also seen a complete accounting blind eye being deliberately turned to some very bad behavior in some of the corporate failures. So we set up a system to make sure that everything goes through properly, but it doesn't always work. If the shareholders are not involved or the shareholders are not interested, again, that can be a symptom that things are going badly. So short term view is adopted. Let's make a quick buck now. We'll push the problem into the next financial year. That can cause all sorts of problems. And we saw similar things with Tesco in recent years um, being fined for that sort of behavior. So these are the sort of symptoms of poor corporate governance. You need to be able to understand why we do it, what it looks like if corporate governance is bad and the possible consequences of what happens. And that's the sort of things we'll be asking you about. Finally, just in this one, let's just think about all of the things we've done on the module kind of tie together to tell you about the business environment. OK, we begin with law. And as I say, law is non-negotiable. It sets the framework which companies have to deal with. They have to register with Company House. They have to have a memorandum of association. They have to have a certain number of directors and the company secretary they have to meet. So the law is laid down of things they must do. And if they don't do that, you know, they can be pursued by the state and the business can be in real trouble and end up uh, wound up. And then on the other hand, we've talked to ethics. Now, ethics is a much less well defined. It's not about rules and things you must do. It's about how you ought to behave. 
um, and it's a sort of voluntary set of codes not wholly voluntary of course as we've seen if you want to operate as an accountant you have to sign up to the code um, and in a way these you must do society expects you to behave ethically but it's not as man not mandatory in the same way that law is and in the middle for companies is kind of corporate governance bridging and negotiating between the two some of its stuff you've got to do some of its stuff you ought to do and it's um, the interaction of all these things is complicated to get hold of but we look at them as separate topics but actually when you get back out into the real world they all overlap and we've seen that a little bit and we'll probably you'll probably notice that if you watch the ethics video as well as the corporate governance one that there are some sim similarities and we look at similar situations where things have gone wrong to draw lessons for ourselves about ethics and about corporate governance okay thanks very much